Good afternoon, everybody. I'm here um, to introduce Jan Fried, Professor Jan Fried from KCC, a leading expert on ASL. Thank you, Jan, for talking today about ASL. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I come from Kapilani Community College, where all of the American Sign Language and interpreter education um, relating to sign language and English is housed. So let me talk a little bit about what I'm going to be doing. As you know, interpreting is interpreting. And just the language is different. But there are a few other things that differ. And so that's what I want to be able to hit today in my presentation about language proficiency, which is a little bit different between what sign language interpreters do and spoken language interpreters do, or how we're prepared, um, our education and professional development, credentialing, um, the additional venues you might find us, which might be different than spoken language interpreters, our placement and the, and the use of relay or inter intermediary interpreters. And then we'll talk a little bit about legislation. I'm going to weave that in because legislation has a tremendous bearing on our ability to interpret and the fact that it legitimizes what we do. Anytime you have any questions, please just jump right in. Um, and I'm happy to go ahead and answer any questions that you've got. So these are the things I'm going to hit, but really, the process that we use as interpreters is the same, no matter what the language is. But how we came into the field is much, much different than what spoken language interpreters have experienced. And so that's some of the things I want to highlight. Maybe. Perhaps. If it wants to go to the next slide. Hello. There we go. So. It's really important. I'm going to give you a brief history of time. <laughs> I'm going to make this the fastest history lesson you've ever seen. But it's really just to give you an idea that really the field of um, sign language interpreting is very young by, by comparison to other fields. And even by comparison to spoken language interpreting, which a lot of people think is rather young anyway. I'm talking about in terms of its formality. I mean, as long as there have been deaf people who've tried to communicate with people who are not deaf, there's always been someone interpreting, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But we really became, started to become formalized in 1964. That was the Ball State Conference. It was a conference that was kind of coming onto the heels of the vocational rehabilitation movement and some legislation that was passed. And all of a sudden, there were people were like, oh, you know what? If we're going to be serving people with disabilities and deaf people, oh, man, how are we going to communicate with these folks? Uh, maybe we need to have some interpreters. Oh, but there aren't any interpreters. Not really. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to pay them? Oh my God, where are we going to get them? So there was this conference, and the people who attended were people who were VR counselors, were people who were teaching in deaf schools. They were people who had deaf parents. So they quickly rallied the troops and um, started identifying that interpreting needed to be a service, and they needed to go ahead and formalize the process. They needed to figure out how people are going to be educated. This also came on the heels of when William Stokey, who was a linguistic researcher, actually started as an English professor at Gallaudet University. And he started noticing that what deaf people were doing was very different than English. And there was this misconception that American Sign Language is like English. So he started getting um, some deaf people to become researchers. And they started looking at sign language and developing basically a corpus for American Sign Language. And the dictionary then was recognized in, in the mid-60s. And um, so this whole movement of understanding that deaf people need interpreters and really understanding that American Sign Language is different than English kind of came at the same time. It was just lovely zeitgeist. So um, in 1965, right after the Ball State Conference, then the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf was established, and it truly just was a registry. Got a bunch of names? You need some names? Here you go. <laughs> People who can sign? There you go. And, um, but that actually moved into also establishing the first certifications um, about eight years later. In the meantime, there is the Rehabilitation Act 
1973, and that was Section 504, which required um, equal access. For any organization that was receiving federal funding, they had to make sure that their services were accessible. And so again, that was another way that interpreters, sign language interpreters, were legitimized. And so now we have these, this need for interpreters, and it's kind of like, where are we going to get them? So the National Interpreter Training Consortium began, and they started setting up um, several interpreting programs across the country. And at that time, they started with four. And again, people really didn't know how to teach interpreting. There wasn't, at this point, a lot of conversation between sign language interpreters and spoken language interpreters. People thought, well, sign language is kind of like English, even though Stokey's Dictionary had been published only 10 years before. Well, it's magic. People who are interpreting rank, well, you know, we just do it. And so there was this notion that, well, you can teach interpreting in you know, a year. You have people take sign language for a year, and then they take a year-long series of interpreting classes, and out they go. How many of you would ever think of studying a language for a year and then thinking that you can interpret? I mean, what a weird concept. But for some reason, that was flying in the sign language field. <laughs> it was a crazy concept. I remember having studied several languages before I started studying sign language. I thought, oh, come on, really? I'd been trying to speak Spanish for many, many years. I would never, ever, ever think I could interpret. But there I was. I found myself in an interpreting program, one year of sign language and one year of interpreting, and there I went. So after that, in 1979, the Conference of Interpreter Trainers was formed. And all of a sudden, these people from around the country, it was a wonderful group of people, started coming together and looking at what is interpreting? How do we do this? And in 1983 and 1984, the, the, the focus of the conference, it was an annual conference, uh, the trainers, and they focused on task analysis. And it was three days of all these people sitting around going, OK, what do we do? We do this. Wait a minute. How do we get there? And every step was broken down. And so it was a way to isolate every task that an interpreter does. And the following year was, how do we teach these things then? And that really informed and interpreting programs after that. And after, um, around the time that task analysis was being identified, then a, then a woman who was a phenomenal interpreter educator by the name of Betty Colonymous, and also, at the, almost the same time, Dennis Coakley, both of them were really looking at the process of interpreting. And they actually then came up with the process model, both of them all independently. Dennis's his, his dissertation work was that. And he basically, he answered the question of, what do interpreters do? And he had it in a nice little sociolinguistic model. You could kind of whip it out of your wallet and go, you want to know what we do in a split second? This is what we do. <laughs> and they're looking at it sociolinguistically. But it was really looking at the process, cognitively, what we do. Um, how do we search for that message, the, the source message coming in? How do we analyze that for all of its components? How do we then isolate the message? How do we then reformulate it into the target language? Um, it's really following on the heels of some of the work that Igor Hona did and also Nancy Schwader Nicholson. So it was, now we start having the spoken language interpreter educators and the sign language interpreter educators coming together, and it was a really lovely marriage for a while, lots and lots of cross fertilization. And then we have, we have the, um, the task force in 1989 that was really looking at um, identifying the needs of deaf children. The educational needs for deaf children. It was huge, huge um, action that happened. And as a result of a white paper being written and really changing the face of what, what was being presented to deaf kids in school. So that has a bearing on then interpreters because interpreters are also in K-12 settings. At the same time, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act, another piece of legislation that basically legislates our and legitimizes our presence. So that's a huge difference between sign language interpreters and spoken language interpreters. We've got lots of lots of legislation that says you need to be there. All going back to if we're going to have equal access, then that means communication access to not just overcoming physical barriers, but also communication barriers. At the same time, um, RID is changing their certifications, trying to make them more responsive. Um, 
Then there's the establishment of the certification maintenance program, which basically says no longer can you just rest on your laurels and say you were you were credentialed 20 years ago. You got to you know keep up with the field. We need to we need to be able to have proof that you really are staying frosty with your skills and knowledge. That works for some people. Um, and then in Hawaii, there was the Hawaii um, Revised Statutes, so that the at the time it was the Commission on Persons with Disabilities was trying to interpret what the ADA said, which was an interpreter is a communication um, accommodation, and we're, we're kind of like a, a device, but they basically went broad with their language, which said deaf people are, um, can have a qualified interpreter, but they don't define what a qualified interpreter is. And so they really left that to the states to define. So Hawaii did that. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, Hawaii did that in um, 1990. So, and, and actually one of the first states to really define that. And I think it's, I like the way it's defined here in the state. So then we have the no child left behind. Oh, I'm sorry, actually I skipped over um, in 1975 is the least restrictive environment or the Individual Disabilities Education Act, which has been reauthorized a number of times. Again, so that goes to that task force of the education of deaf children. So as long as deaf kids are being uh, um, included with children with disabilities in having educational reform or having supposedly having rights for communication and least restrictive environment was interpreted as wow, we'll just put an interpreter in a school because then the deaf kids can be with hearing kids. Actually, a least restrictive environment or a, a language-rich environment is actually a deaf school for a kid, a deaf child, because then everyone signs. But that, that comes later in the, in the show <laughs> about that. So, and then in 19, um, I'm sorry, in 2004, there's the National Coalition of, of it's a National Commission on Interpreting, and the, um, the <laughs> National Interpreting Certificate. <laughs> so we have another change in the certification process, which I'll show you in a little bit what that means. And then it, we got revised again in 2011. And then in, actually, but in, 20, uh, in 2008, there was the establishment of an educational floor for sign language interpreters who were going to be credentialed. Whew. OK. That was like fast and furious about really what precipitated us being able to be here as sign language interpreters. But really, who are we? And how did we get here? So interpreters come in different flavors. <laughs> the original interpreters really were homegrown. These were the people who were codas and sodas, which are children of deaf adults or siblings or spouses of deaf adults. So basically, you've got deaf family members. And you are raised by the community. You, have, you are considered to be a deaf community member. You understand your girl. You you've now are sharing the same culture with your parents. I mean, to, to step back a bit, only 10% of deaf people have deaf parents. So you're talking about people who are growing up who do not share the same language and culture with their parents. But when a deaf adult has a child who can hear, they make sure the child is included. So generally, children, hearing children of deaf adults, their first language is American Sign Language most often, not always, but more often than not, especially the oldest child. Because the oldest child ends up interpreting for his or her sibs, but the oldest child usually becomes the interpreter. <laughs> but at this time, there's, remember, there's no technology at this point. Initially, we're talking about, you know, this is pre-60s, 70s. There's really not any technology. So deaf people really relied on their kids. And there's no formal profession of interpreting. So when a deaf adult has to go to the doctor and they have a four-year-old, it's the four-year-old who's interpreting. We all know how inappropriate that is. We know that and we see that in other language communities where kids are often recruited unwillingly <laughs> to be interpreters and they don't have the language. They don't have the register, the linguistic register. They don't have the language and the experience to be able to interpret some of the things they're being asked to interpret. It's crazy down. But, that's the, but the reality is, is these kids are also then going to and appreciating the types of activities that their parents are involved in. So it's deaf clubs, it's all these gatherings where they're seeing storytelling, they're seeing the language in action. They're, it's a, you know this 
um, beautiful communication that's happening, and these kids are just naturally embodying it. So they are the perfect interpreters. Um, of course, a lot of them only have one register, which is conversational. They, you know, unless they're privy to going to a funeral or some presentations where they're seeing formal sign language, more often than not, they're just they've got that register, which is a lot of like a lot of third culture 1.5 kids have is that kind of very conversational with your parents sort of language. So we have the Hunger interpreters who are the Sotas and the Kodas. We also have people coming from the church. And this is, again, before the profession really becomes such, it becomes good work. And who are the people who have time to volunteer from churches? Women. So it becomes primarily people, the interpreting profession is primarily peopled by women. And it's considered to be women's work, volunteer work. It's good service, and that's a good thing. But um, later on, as we try to professionalize interpreting, it becomes a challenge. So this is so we've got the homegrown, the church members, the CODAs, and then the related professionals. If you remember, I just mentioned that the Ball State Conference in 1964, the attendees were VR counselors, teachers who are working with deaf and hard of hearing kids, um, counselors, and then again, some of the CODAs. So we see a lot of interpreters. The people who trained me were, and probably Bill, were um, <laughs> people who had been, who came into the profession in a different way. Either they had come in through teaching through deaf schools, or they had been counselors, or they had done something else, and then they were recruited to interpret. And the, the most recent permutation are the folks that have been trained and educated, but they've come to the language late. Most of those folks, and I'm in that group, we didn't learn American Sign Language until we were adults. We all know what that means. <laughs> that's, that's nuts. That's nuts trying to learn how to become incredibly proficient in another language as an adult. Um, and especially with sign language, we never really know what our accent looks like. <laughs> no, everyone's just too polite to tell us, like, oh, really? It's like uh, interpreting through mud <laughs> watching you. But it's a very interesting thing. And, and there was an odd time period where the CODAs and the folks who were going through training programs were really at odds with each other. The CODAs just didn't know what to do. They weren't necessarily embraced because they came in from the, from the community. And then you have the people who have, oh, I have got a degree. I have a certificate. I like no more than you do. And so it was a very odd time also that happens with then some philosophical models about interpreting, where we, we went from helpers, this group over here, you know, of course you would never charge anybody. No, 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 no. You just did it because it was a good thing to do and you were helping out. Or it's like mom and dad's friends, their best friends, uncle and auntie. Of course you're going to interpret. You're not going to charge. So you have the helpers. And then we all of a sudden got this piece, piece of legislation that says, oh, no, interpreters, now you're a profession because um, VR needs you, voc rehab, vocational rehabilitation. And we, the machine model came into play. It was in the 70s, mid-70s. So interpreters were, this is my job. This is only my job. I only interpret. Excuse me, Madam Interpreter, can you turn off the light? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm only interpreter. I can't turn off the light. Um, you know, can you pass this piece of paper? Oh, no, I'm only here to interpret. I'm 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off. And it was like really plugging. It's also called the conduit model. Plug yourself in, plug yourself, you know, unplug yourself. Very odd, very, very odd. There are still some machine model interpreters around. And it's very strange to interpret with that kind of person as a teammate because the field has really moved away from that. And we moved into facilitators, which quickly moved into bicultural, bilingual, multicultural, um, multilingual, the my, my interpreters, which is morphed right now into the ally model. We're really, we're all in it together. We're all in it together. The goal is to make sure there's successful communication, period. And there's lots of ways we need to do that. And it's really about, it's really accommodation theory. <laughs> in its finest is really what it is at this point. So, um, so there's been, so people who've been in the field for a while have experienced the different philosophical changes that have occurred. And it really has touched all of these groups. And these groups are still people who come into the field. And it's really still who we are. Yeah. Various types of interpreters. 
Y yes, I am. I might actually briefly touch on it. Yes, I'm sorry. So the question is, will I talk at all about deaf people's reactions to each of those models? And it was, deaf people were very comfortable with the helper model, truly. And that's a great question. In fact, maybe I'll just quickly address it right now. Um, deaf people were super comfortable with that because that was what they knew. It was, of course, I'm going to ask you know, the, the hearing kids in the community to be the interpreters. But everyone knew that was a weird thing to do. I mean, why do you want to have mediated communication if you can ever have direct communication? So technology has been a huge boon to the deaf community. Deaf people are much more technologically savvy than any, any of the hearing people I know. The, the latest and greatest technology that comes out, deaf people have got it first. <laughs> and they are savvy users because it gives them independence. So it's not... It's changed our field. It has not decreased the need for interpreters. It's just changed how we interpret. So um, the deaf people were not happy with the machine model at all. That was a weird one. So you go to a doctor's office, or sorry, I'm sorry, you're going to go to a, a job interview, and you're sitting in the waiting area with the deaf person. In the machine model age, you would not talk to the deaf person. Well, you still have got to figure out, there's the communication cha-cha that needs to happen. There's got to be some negotiation, negotiated interaction. I've got to be able to see, am I being understood? Am I understanding? We had this notion that the interpreter arrived 20 minutes early, and it was the interpreter who assessed the language needs of the deaf person. It's like, really? Really? Is that just a little bit of linguistic hubris? <laughs> The deaf person is so good at their code switching all the time. They're so fast in this, at, at assessing a person who's using their language as they being the first language user that they're, they've already made all the accommodations. So the interpreter goes, oh, they're using much more signed English or they're using, you know, more ASL-like. It's like, no, if the deaf person's already made this decision for you and they're making it easy for you. So that accommodation, that cha-cha has got to happen. We've got to have time to be able to really figure out what's going on. And you know what? Preparation is nine-tenths of the law as far as I'm concerned as an interpreter. So if I've had a chance to talk to somebody about why they're there, their goals, and I've already talked to the hearing person about their goals, now I've got those goals, those linguistic goals in my head. So I should say conversational goals in my head. I know where they're, each of them are coming from. And all my lexical items, everything that I'm going to do as an interpreter is really going to be guided by that. So it's really important. So the machine model was a funky thing. Nope, can't, can't talk to you. Yep, I'm only interpreter. I'm only on my 20 minutes, and I'm off my 20 minutes. And then the bye bye my my ally model has been. Everyone's pretty groovy with it. They like that. It's because it's about. In fact, even our code of professional conduct has changed um, to reflect that there are times where we need to kind of give people a little bit of information. We try not to insert ourselves because, our, of course, our primary tenant is confidentiality, not at, at all um, um, overlaying our opinion on anything, you know, not counsel or advise. But it, once in a while, we have to give some cultural information. We kind of go, oh, yeah, you're going to get, you ask this question, you're going to get this answer this way because this is how semantically linguistically, grammatically, it works in this language, and vice versa. Yeah, Sue. Um, are you going to talk about the ethics at all, or should I raise it right now? Because you just mentioned what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> go ahead and mention it right okay. now. Okay, and you can, all right. So I see the court thing, and you can repeat the repeat. Yeah. But um, uh, because in court not long ago, I walked in, and I saw an ASL interpreter chatting away with his, the defendant before the judge came in. And I came in um, as a spoken language interpreter, and um, I said hi to the defendant, and I sat down, more of the machine model, I guess. But they're just chatting away, chatting away. And then I got up and walked over somewhere, and then the interpreter said to me, a very good interpreter, she said to me, oh, uh, the deaf person can't believe you speak Chinese. You know, and I'm like, okay, so you're telling him about me, and you're telling him about... I just thought that was weird. And then when they went forward to do, uh, when she was actually interpreting, it was a brilliant job, very, very good. But I was just surprised at how familiar, of how the ally model could it have gone too far. Uh, so the notion is, how, <laughs> how far is far? Um, really, what are the boundaries, ethical boundaries for interpreters, particularly in certain venues? 
And you know, and it's and it's a really great question, Sue, because uh, court, yeah, court is a little bit different. It is a different animal. We both know as as trainers for the judiciary, it's a hard. That's a hard line to toe because we are so accustomed as sign language interpreters to to have a conversation. Because again, we're kind of we're we're doing that that communication linguistic cha cha to figure out do we understand each other? Where do we understand each other? Um, because sign language are just like spoken languages. There's regional variations. Um, how people and also depend depends on when a deaf person has started to lose sign language. <coughs> Where, what kind of education system did it go through? So their language is really shaped by their educational and childhood experiences. So it's not a real clean thing. I mean, it's a, one thing if I know, oh, in this area of China, they're going to use this dialect or they're going to use you know this language. It's just not that clean for sign language interpreters. Um, and so we we, come, we have to have that little bit of conversation, but in court it comes it becomes very dicey because again we never want the we never want to be questioned about you know is there anything unethical going on are we are we unfairly siding with somebody is there bias we never want to have that because we know perception is everything in court so <clears throat> but, but ethics is it. And our ethical codes have changed. It, when we start, when the field started, we had eight tenants, um, and it was confidentiality. It was you know not advising. It was staying faithful to the message. It was um, dressing appropriately. It was asking for payment in judicial manner. A ju sorry, judicious, excuse me, not judicial, judicious manner, and then also then saying we're going to do professional development. We're going to do all of these things. All of the above, we're going to do. So um, there was a need uh, within like about 15 years ago, there was a push to really change those to be more of a code of professional conduct. And we know that ethics are different than conduct. But we felt that as a field, as our field was growing, um, people were in all sorts of venues, which I'm going to talk about in a second, it really, recall, it really called for maybe let's give some people some examples of, of professional co of conduct because we know common sense is not common. And so you can just have ethical standards, but you really need to then be able to explain them just a bit. So, so I mentioned in the beginning that interpreting is interpreting and the languages differ, but also some of the venues do too. We do, and I this is this rep really represents what I do. And I interpret anything from birth to death. I have interpreted births. Literally, I've been in the birthing room as mom is in labor <laughs> and giving instructions in ASL um, you know, from what the doctor is saying and mom is screaming and giving out what she's saying and or maybe dad is, you know, or the partner is deaf and talking about that and there's other people in the room and so yeah, you know, 12 hours of labor, there we, there we are to deaths and I have literally been at the deathbed, interpreting at the deathbed when either the deaf person who is dying is giving last words, or family members are deaf and wanting to hear what the la what someone's last words are, and um, that's a really profound, profound situation to be in. And then also funerals, interpreting funerals, um, interpreting health-related appointments, interpreting performance-related stuff. I mean, the TV, you know, we see the interpreter in the box, um, or interpreters on stage. Community interpreting for job interviews, job training, um, social security interviews, anything that that person wants to do in his or her life. We do that in court, um, presentations, classrooms. That means K-12 and post-secondary. We do a lot of post-secondary interpreting. Um, right now, there is a huge need in Hawaii, right, particularly on Oahu, of post-secondary interpreters. There's just a whole bunch of deaf people out there taking college classes from associate's level all the way to PhD in, in law. Uh, Bill? Do you or anyone you know uh, interpretation? So I'm asked if, I, if either I or anyone else I know interprets interrogations. So law related interpreting, yes, I have done interrogations, I've done um, rape reports, you know, when a rape kit is happening, um, arrests. Raymond and plea, you know, the whole nine yards, investigations, the whole nine yards in that. Some of it's more fun than others. Some of it's really awful. 
Sure. After or during the time frame when an officer, for example, is given Miranda rights, they have to put that on hold. Is that correct? Because that's what they can put over there. Yes, and tr yes, um, at the, that's a great question about Miranda rights. <coughs> And I just saw something um, on a death lift serve today talking about that officers are supposed to wait. And in some uh, jurisdictions, they say, well, you've got an hour. You know, you need to do, wait at least an hour for an interpreter to arrive before you Mirandize somebody or you start processing the individual. Some places is three hours. But it's really hard when it's 2 o'clock in the morning and you're trying to find someone. Now, we used to have an emergency interpreting service here so that interpreters were on call. And in fact, I did a lot of that work when I was on call. Then that changed when um, the contract of for the referral agency changed and they no longer included emergency interpreting which was crazy because you really need interpreters on call 24 hours um so generally the, the, no because it, the, there's no guarantee that a deaf person is literate in english um they may be semi-lingual it could be a deaf person from another country who may know some sign american sign language but they don't know english so to hand them a piece of paper is a challenge. And so as an interpreter who's going to be doing law-related interpreting, and particularly to do the Miranda warning, we have to be able to really have a range of how we might interpret that. Because there might be someone who really doesn't understand the concept of a right. It is your right. Okay, well, we can't get past that one. We, to, we can't do the rest of it until we get to what is a right. And so um, in law-related training, we actually go through the Miranda rights, the Miranda warning, and what that means, and really being able to understand it. And the best of all possible worlds is that we have a deaf interpreting teammate. And so that's that relay interpreter, that intermediary interpreter. We're really working as a team. Um, and so, and, and in fact, I might work with a deaf interpreter in any of these situations. And if some of these venues do require specialized training and credentialing, which is really great. And in fact, all of them should. But things have changed. <laughs> so let's look a little bit about speaking of specialized training and education. So the interpreting programs in the US, they initially started, as I mentioned, on the associates level was that notion of one year language, one year interpreting, you're good to go. Have fun now. <laughs> See you later. So there are currently 71 um, AA or associate level programs in the country. Some have closed, some have opened, but it's always, it hovers at around 70. There's about 140 interpreting programs in the United States on, on all levels. The bachelor's level, there are 27. And that's a recent phenomenon. There were um, a couple that started when I mentioned the, and the NITC, that was this notion in 1975 of getting some, some training centers going. Um, one of them was a bachelor's degree program, and that was at Cal State University Northridge. But most of them have been on the associate's level. So it's been, um, the bachelor's degree has changed because we now have dun, 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 an educational floor. Before you stand for the national credential, you must now have um, a bachelor's degree. It actually went quickly from 2008 to, from an associate's degree to 2012, a bachelor's degree. And for deaf people, as of now, they need to have an associate's degree and they'll need a bachelor's degree in a couple more years. So it's really pushing that because we, we know we run the gamut of the consumer. Some people might have a PhD, another person may be semi-lingual, and everyone in between. We have to be able to have the linguistic and experiential range and educational range to be able to then match the, the folks that we're going to be working with and be able to handle the language. So this, this has now happened. The bachelor's degree programs have um, sprung up probably within the last 10 years. And then only one of them is actually a continuing education program. And that actually assumes you've already got a degree before you go into the program. So it's kind of a post, kind of a post back program. And then there are four master's degree programs. Actually, I was in the very first one that ever started. Um, and that was in we graduated, uh, getting my age, 1991. Uh, but we were the very first master's degree program, and that was in Maryland at Western Maryland College, which is now McDaniel College. 
and it was only housed there because it could be. <laughs> but the people, some of the luminaries I've just mentioned, and Betty Kalonymus, Dennis Coakley, MJ Bienvenue, these are all the people who were the leading interpreter educators who were actually running that program, so it was really quite exciting. And we have one, mass, um, one PhD program that just opened up two years ago at Gallaudet University. So it's, um, it's, it's good. It's really good. We have options. All, what, we're ha what we're seeing now are more and more articulation agreements between the associate's degree programs and the bachelor's degree programs. So, um, in fact, that's one of the things that my program is doing is, is having articulation agreements so that our students have, a, have that pipeline to get a bachelor's degree. Right now, that educational floor about having a bachelor's degree is a non-specific. Non you don't have to have a degree in interpreting, but hey, why not? If you want to be the best practitioner possible, let's get a bachelor's degree or more or higher um, to be a practitioner. And then the other thing that's required is um, the certification maintenance program. We have to do 80 hours of continuing education for every four-year cycle. So, and that's, that's huge. It's good. It's really, really good. And because of technology, we've got so many, many options. This 30 and two years, this is for the state credential that just started um, a year ago where any credential interpreters from the state of Hawaii have to have 30 hours in within a two-year period. So there's a constant need for professional development, interpreting students from sign language English. From the day they step foot in class, they are told they're going to need continuing education. So it's a very natural thing. It's not hard to get them into taking workshops. That built out a workshop for us. Um, so as I said, it's some of the professional development is uh, affiliated with colleges and universities, and some of it's just private people, private, private, private businesses. So, KCC, what do we do at KCC? The various iterations of my program still include these. <laughs> and what do these, what do these numbers mean? And I say various iterations of the program because right now um, I've taken what was initially a continuing ed program over two years that would just focus on interpreting um, and it was general interpreting to then for the last 10 years we've had um, an associate's degree program that was 75 credits for NAS and that was um, focusing on educational interpreting although we still prepare people to interpret with adults but it was primarily getting people to understand what it means to interpret with kids. And um, the latest version is probably going to be a concentrated, intensive three-semester program. So that would be you have to come in language ready, so you'll have been um, assessed with a, an LPI. And then um, we will have four-week blocks. These, this will all be squished into four-week modules. Students will be going five hours a day. So three, uh, three hours language, I'm sorry, three hours interpreting, two hours language and then um, mandatory lab on Friday. So what do all these numbers mean? Well, it's IT 101 is an introduction to interpreting, and that's ethics, and the history of the field and the profession and, and current issues. 102 is interpreting readiness. It's understanding about memory, um, understanding how to differentiate a main point from a detail, being able to then um, understand the, um, the salient point speakers, the reason why they're saying what they're saying, where are they going with it. It's really the, starting to understand the uh, understanding the need for prosody and understanding what prosody is. And then be, be, they're introduced into the interpreting process. So what does that process model mean? How do you navigate through taking the source message, finding out what it is, and then reformulating it? And then also understanding about depth of processing. <clears throat> Then um, 111 is um, comparative linguistics. It's always important to make sure that the students really are good in English and really good in ASL, and then can be able to then move right into translation. I have an asterisk next to 112 because we don't do as much translation as spoken language interpreters do, but we do. What we translate will be off, me will be off media, will be off a video, um, a vlog, you know, a video, sort of video blog. Um, we'll take a, a written text and put it into video. So we do, if I'm going to do some performance interpreting, I do a translation. Um, sometimes we do double translations if we're doing Shakespeare, for example. We'll go into modern English and then from there to, to American Sign Language. Is this during the process? I'm sorry, the translation process? 
So what, one of the things, so one of the things they learn how to do in 111 and 112 is how to transcribe. So there is a note, there is a whole movement to do sign writing to be able to codify ASL in a way that doesn't have to depend on English. You can either gloss or you can actually transcribe using some of the sign writing methods. Um, I teach my students to do the glossing with transcription symbols so they really are understanding what it is that they're doing and then they can, then anyone can look at this gloss with the transcription and the grammatical symbols and then be able to recreate it. So I, um, I have my students translate certain documents and songs and popular things that they're going to need to know like the pledge and national anthem and Hawaii Pono E and those sorts of things that they're going to be doing repeatedly. So. And then we do translation, back translation. They have opportunity to do that in teams. They'll do some team interpreting. Uh, team, I'm sorry, team translations. So then we move into consecutive interpreting because, of course, consecutive interpreting is where it's at. It's where it's really accurate. But our field has come slow to really embracing consecutive interpreting. We jumped right into simultaneous when really consecutive interpreting gives us that opportunity to be super accurate. Um, but it's a new thing for us to be. Sorry, I've got a little bug climbing on my glasses. Um, it's a new thing for us to be actually looking at note taking and to be really embracing consecutive interpreting. Um, in all the classes, the students are working on cultural competency. They're looking at power and language dynamics, um, looking at intercultural and um, and cross cultural interactions. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to zap that. They're looking at discourse analysis, prosodics, um, teamwork, um, diplomacy, business practices, understanding boundaries, decision making using a model that we borrowed from psychology called demand control schema. And this ethical decision making, it's phenomenal. And so if that's being infused through everything. 201 and 202 is simultaneous interpreting. We go to 211, which is a weird thing only sign language interpreters do, and that's transliteration, which we're actually looking in the purview of English. So when, when English is made visible and we're, and we're signing in more English-like order, it's very weird. It's really only a thing that, that's, that pertains to sign language English interpreters. And then IT294 is the capstone. So that's when the students are doing their um, internship. They're, they're developing their portfolio to show how they meet all the exit competencies for the program. Throughout the whole process, they're doing service learning, tiered mentorships, and lots of field work. So this is, and it's a pretty much just a standard. This is, this is um, best practices in our field. Of course, yeah, Bill. Oh, are they, so are they using this, in the, sign, the English sign methods? Actually, we're really looking at, we call it transliteration, but really it's contact varieties of sign. And so it, again, it's all accommodation. It's really like this person signs this way. This is what we need to do. This is how we're going to interact. And I will interpret accordingly. Person B is going to maybe do something different. Person C is going to do something different. So it's linguistic accommodation. So, um, But we still have, we show them how we're going to continue to use ASL features, but it's more English ordered. Yeah, it's nuts. It's nuts, but we do it. The challenges and follow of you in interpreting education programs, spoken or signed, no, we always look horribly under-enrolled. And there's no getting around it because not everyone is suited to be an interpreter. And we do, we have suitability profiles. We really try to vet students before they get here. And sometimes we find out, you know, a student who may be incredibly gifted linguistically, I mean, they just are so proficient in language, really make rotten interpreters. Um, and sometimes people who are struggling trying to understand the language really get, they get it. They get the, di the diplomatic aspect. They have the interpersonal skills. They've got life behind them. They understand how to navigate and negotiate language. They can really see, they get, they get the interpreting process. They can manage it. And process management is hard, and not everyone can do it. They might go through the first part of the program thinking, they're, yeah, yeah, I got it, I get it, I get it. And then they get to the second part where it's going to be all of a sudden you're putting all these pieces together, either doing consecutively or simultaneously, and they just fail miserably. Now we try to cycle people through a few times. We try, we try not to, we try to be a little bit more mastery based and not boot them out. So that's another challenge is trying to keep them within this academic structure. We're supposed to get people through in two years or get them through in four years. Well, 
you just don't learn language and you don't learn interpreting that way. So we've found all sorts of interesting ways to finesse, <laughs> finesse that. So, but it's, um, it, there's also attrition and it's, and it's very interesting. What we've, one of the things we've had to address too are changing venues. So interpreters now, sign language interpreters are found in uh, what are called video relay services. So a deaf person doesn't necessarily want to use a text telephone. So again, it's going through an operator and the operator sees what's coming up on his or her screen and then um, reads that off into spoken English to the hearing person. The hearing person says something and she or he types it and then the deaf person sees it on their screen. Well, that change, that technology has changed and now people have video relay. I mean, there's Skype, there's FaceTime, there's video phones. People can do direct communication, but if they want to talk to a deaf person or a hearing person want to talk to each other, one fantastic way is through the video relay service. So a deaf person then calls up the operator, the operator pops up on a screen, the operator is a credentialed interpreter, and he or she sees the message in ASL and then goes ahead and simultaneous and speaks it into spoken English and then whatever the hearing person says goes simultaneously into um, ASL. And so it's really fantastic and it lets deaf people become super, super, super independent. They don't have to really feel like they're relying on an interpreter if they want to call um, their doctor or whatever and discuss some things. And there's certain things that are not allowed to be discussed. There's a whole big issue about video relay and some of the issues around that in terms of ethics. And then the other venue is, um, video, re is video remote interpreting. So I want to be at home. I can have a private space, a secure space set up, and I can interpret in my jammy bottoms, and I can look like this on top. <laughs> but I have my jammy bottoms. I mean, I can stay at home. It's really great for the fact that we just don't have enough interpreters, period. State of Hawaii, across the country, and other places where American Sign Language is used, there are not enough interpreters. But that's limited, correct? It's uh, very limited. Conferences, and I also heard, like, at Queens, they said that seems like a lot of the deaf don't like the video interpreting. No, it's taking a three-dimensional language and smushing it into two dimensions. It's not perfect at all. In fact, in fact we always build that as the last resort. We really always want to have face-to-face -face interpreting because it's not ideal. Um, it's very hard. I mean, there's so much that we're reading. Again, it's the paralinguistic, metalinguistic stuff that we're getting aside from just the language coming through. And we're interpreting a flick of the eyebrow. And if it's hard to see that flick of the eyebrow, I mean, even the dilation of eyeball, you know, of, of your pupils, we're, we're seeing that and that influences what we're doing um, in terms of prosody. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know, actually I don't have any slides. <laughs> Who is a qualified interpreter? So I mentioned that the Americans with Disabilities Act said, that deaf people, deaf and hard of hearing people, are entitled to request a qualified interpreter. What does that mean? So again, it's um, up to the states to decide what a qualified interpreter is. And the state of Hawaii said, ah, a qualified interpreter in this state means someone who has gone through an interpreter education program. They have an interpreting credential, and they have experience interpreting as, you know, they've, they've, they, they've got um, time in, They've got the education and then they've got the piece of paper and it's really, really important. Um, it's quality assurance, all of this, because when you've got that credential, it says you're abiding as an interpreter to the, um, reg the RID's code of professional conduct. And it's so comforting for the professional, for the consumers, for the field to know that there's that quality assurance. It's, um, I, I love it. One of the things I have my interpreting students do is devise a code of ethics for them to really understand. <laughs> I have one of my former students in my class, right in, in the audience, and she knows that they have to develop their own code of ethics. It really gets them to think about what is going to make people at ease to know that interpreters, what do they need to know? What do they do? How are they going to do it? Um, so... When we talk about credentials, however, alphabet soup. Wait till you see what I'm about to show you. So, ID. ID since 19, since the late 1960s, or actually this is the first credential in the 70s, we had the interpreting credential, the, in, I'm sorry, 
Oh, it was supposed to be IC, wait, TC. Sorry, it was supposed to be TC. ICTC. Anyway, anyway, these are, I mean, this is current, these are all currently recognized, but not all um, awarded. But all of these under ID are still recognized. There have been several of us, and I've been one of them, who's actually tried to push to get some of these taken away so that we just say, look, let's clean the slate, make everyone take one particular type of exam, and talk about quality assurance. We've got some conformity here where we know what the standards are going to be, yay, 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 but no. <laughs> so no, these are all still recognized. I have the CDI in yellow because that is the... Um, Certification for deaf interpreters, and it's a really important thing. We've really been pushing to try to get more deaf hearing teams and really get people to recognize them. It's a really important thing because it basically says that we're, when I have a deaf hearing team, I specialize in a language and my partner specializes in language, and we know everyone's going to get the best product um, going. The NIC, so this was the new ones that were offered now through RID. There was Nick. Or the, I'm sorry, the National Interpreting Certificate, which was the um, basic one. Then there was the advanced and the master, but that was only offered for a few years because there was too much inconsistency. Some people who were getting, they just finished an interpreting program and they somehow took their test and got a master. We said, no, 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 <laughs> that's not right. There should be no way that happens. And they were finding there was inconsistency in the rating. So then they went, RID went, oh, no, no, we take those all back, but you can still have them. But we're not going to, you know, we're not awarding anymore. We're just now going to recognize and award an NIC. It's a different one than the first NIC. So how crazy is that? I mean, are people really, consumers really going to know what that means? No, and it's just really unfair to consumers, I think. The National Association of the Deaf had their own test for a while, and they were testing levels one through five. And initially they called it novice to crackerjack. They quickly reeled that one back in and said one through five. Um, they were, there was a little bit of unhappiness between the two organizations, the interpreting organization and the deaf community, and um, now everyone is on the same page, and that's how the NIC got developed, because it was actually the deaf community and the interpreting community coming together and really developing a very good credential. And then there's the Educational Interpreters Performance Assessment. Those are for people working in K-12 settings, and they have ratings 1 through 5, but you can be a 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 all the way to a 5. So, um, and you can specialize in depending upon if you want to just test in um, elementary or secondary. So that's another really interesting thing. And then we have the quali Hawaii Quality Assurance Screening, and that's levels 1 through 5, and 3 is considered qualified, plus there is the plus H, which is if you, you take a, Another additional test that will look at your ability to interpret local signs and local language. I won't even say pigeon because it's not necessarily so, but yeah. So then there's a mental health. Now there's a mental health program that is credentialing people just if you go through their program. That's in, um, in Arkansas? No. It's in the South. So... And then some states have their own credentials like we do in here in Hawaii. So that's, that's why I say it's alphabet soup, and it's very hard for the consumer. They don't know who they're getting. I think they just want to know, are you certified? Are you credentialed? Because at least all of these say you've gone through some kind of test. And the test is usually knowledge and also performance. And you're, in, you're interpreting various scenarios. So with that, I actually have one last slide. I'm so good. <laughs> okay, one last slide. Joys and challenges, because that was something Andrew put on that I would that I would talk about. So the joys, I love interpreting because of the variety of work and the variety of people. I it just I have been as I said in every place with you know as I said people who've just come to this country to dignitaries, um, high very high profile interpreting. I get paid to learn. I love post-secondary interpreting. I have gone through, I've interpreted through an OT program. I've interpreted, um, occupational therapy program. Went all the way through. I went through, I have a degree in psychology, my bachelor's degree. I went through the entire psychology program at my alma mater with a, with a deaf student, but she took a different track. So I got to interpret all the classes I never got to take. It's like, woo! So <laughs> it's really fun. Performance interpreting, hey, there are a lot of people on stage who don't get paid, but we get paid. 
Um, and it's fun. I mean, a lot of us are just total closet hams. And so it's a really nice way to be able to um, act without having to audition. And then the collegiality is extraordinary with spoken language interpreters, with sign language interpreters. Um, it's, it's really amazing. The challenges have been um, people not understanding what we do. It's, they just don't, they, they don't get interpreting. But I think it's the state of Hawaii, a lot of people do, but there's always that pocket of people who um, really, they're not quite sure what the task is and what we're responsible for. And oftentimes they think, oh, well, you must know the deaf person. Does that person, can they hear? Can they speak? Can they do this? Can they do that? What happened to them? It's like, well, I don't know. And I'm not here to speak for them. I'm here to interpret anything that's going on. But I don't speak for the deaf person. And that's that whole power dynamic. And so that's a real challenge. The other one, since this has been relatively hot off the presses, um, unqualified and unethical practitioners, let us say, can we all say South African interpreter? <laughs> um, there's been a very, very good thing that's happened because of that person who clearly was in the wrong place, did not have the language acumen, was not interpreting any language that anyone knew. South Africans who are deaf or interpreters went, this person's not interpreting any language we know, um, kept repeating the same sign. And so we really talked about how interpreters are vetted, how um, people who are, who are sponsoring high um, profile events, they need to do a better job of ensuring security and ensuring quality interpreters because that was, of course, we know, um, disrespectful to Nelson Mandela's memory was disrespectful to the deaf community, it was, it was disrespectful to everyone involved. And so um, the upshot is that deaf people really stood up on this one and said, this has got to stop, which was great, because it had to really come from deaf people. And the interpreting community was going, yes, 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 yes. So it was a real good thing. So, whew. OK. So the last minute that I've, or second that I've got, since we started just a touch late, is, um, oh, sorry, this was to come a little later. Um, questions and answers. Since I know some of you asked some questions while I was um, talking, but any other questions? Bill? Uh, I'm frustrated uh, <laughs> because I was one of the people who were going to interpret the Spanish language and I have to do AS3, there were no bachelor's degree. Right. Thank you. That, it, it's true. Now we have that path. People can continue. And in fact, the new PhD program at Gallaudet University has the, you want to continue to be a practitioner as a PhD, or do you want to be a researcher? And one of the things that when I was in that, as I said, I was in that first master's program, they really were pushing us to research, to do research, because there just hadn't been anything. And now, I mean, in the, in the last 20 years, the statistics are there. We have, um, we have, um, quantitative and qualitative research in our field that's really solid. Again, we're also working with spoken language interpreters. We're exchanging information because it's the same. Most of it is the same. When I said placement, by the way, placement is different in court. We, we stand in a different place than, um, than, than spoken language interpreters do. But otherwise, pretty much everything's the same. So just to follow up with that question, I noticed that you said you interpret in all these settings, um, but you're also a professor, a teacher. I am. And so do you think that's important to the profession, or can you talk about that? Thank you. That was a great question. As, a, as, an, as an educator, is it important that I also be a practitioner? Absolutely. I would have no credibility with my students. Because I go out, one of the things I do in that IT 294 class, which is the, um, the, the capstone or our practicum class, I observe my students working. And so I've got to be able to see what they're doing. I have to understand what they're doing. They've got to trust that I know what they're doing and what, um, and I, that I, they know what, I, they, they trust that I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I also mentor students. So I will bring them along to assignments and we work together. But I make sure they're low risk assignments. I don't try to put them in anything high risk. So it is incredibly important as, a, as an educator to be a practitioner. I can't stress that enough. Um, we all know lots of fields where people just don't touch the work anymore. And they just teach and really, how much credibility does that person have? Other questions? Sasha? You said your enrollment looks low. It does. What is it? Well, it's interesting. Um, Gallaudet University, for example, which is the preeminent university for deaf and hard of hearing people and deaf blind people, um, they cap their interpreting classes at 10. Mm -hmm. 
So there's, it's really interesting. I, did, I just did a lot of research on this, and there are two ends of the enrollment scale. There are the, most of the programs are between 10 and 15 students. Again, most places that's under-enrolled. Or they're at 35. That's kind of like nothing in between. So it's either people, um, programs that are in major metropolitan areas, there's lots of feeder programs, um, large deaf communities, large interpreting communities. Um, they might be more on that 35 end of things. But most of our programs are between 10 and 15. And they might start with 15 and then lose half. Um, that changed for us. We actually started that way where we were losing about half between the first and second year. And then we just got better with screening and better with support. And so um, we are now retaining most of our students from beginning to end. But still, but that's like 7 to 10 students. So. Administrators are not very happy about that. And we have to get grants. That's what we really rely on external funding so that we can kind of fly under the radar. Yeah. And if, in our summer, I know we cap it at 10. Yeah. And it makes sense because we're talking, I mean, this is intensive stuff. You're trying to give people feedback all the time. They're working on them, they're working and working and working, and you've got to be able to assess it. And you just can't do that if you've got 40 students. It's very, very difficult to turn that around. Any other questions? What's your pay like? Oh, I didn't talk about pay. I, that was one, I'm sorry, it was one thing I was going to mention is the fact that one of the differences between spoken and sign language interpreters is that based on we're paid according to credential, but also something that's been a, a trend for the, probably the last five or six years has been the two-hour minimum. So you don't walk out the door unless you're being paid for two hours. And it was this fight. I mean, I know I was feeling incredibly guilty. Again, I come from this service profession model of like, oh, you know, oh, social service perspective. You know, I can't ask for a raise. I remember the very first time I asked for a raise, I was interpreting regularly. I had just, um, I was in California and I had not been in a working interpreter for too long, but I was working for one organization, regularly interpreting. And I, I told the HR person, I said, I just want to let you know, I, Raising my rates, I think it was like from twenty dollars an hour to twenty five. This was many years ago, and she just broke into hysterics and she said, "Never apologize for raising your rates. Do you have any idea what our vendors charge us?" And they never apologize for raising their rates. She goes, "You're doing, you know, you're qualified at what you're doing. You've got a credential for what you're doing. You charge accordingly." I thought that was very enlightening for me um, and very freeing. So yeah, so we, um, right now, the standard is 27 to 65 an hour, depending upon your credential. At and then at a two hour minimum. And although it's negotiated, because sometimes I don't charge it two I don't charge two hours. It depends on the organization and the function. If I'm literally going to be there 15 minutes and it's across the street, I won't charge a two hour minimum. Um, it also depends whether or not we have night differential now, we have weekend differential. And also, if you're doing law-related interpreting, sometimes it may, may or may not be more. <laughs> if we're also working with specialized clients, um, because we've had specialized training, working with people who are deafblind, it's a very different kind of interpreting. So, Yes, yes. Do Have I seen a change since the 80s? I've seen a change since the passage of the ADA, which was in 1990. Um, a huge change. People get it. Most organizations understand. In fact, the um, Commission on Persons with Disabilities and, the, um, and their arm, which is now Disability and Communication Access Board, built a fund in for a while. Like if you didn't, your organization, if you were a nonprofit organization and you didn't have in your budget something, a, a line item for interpreting, for like up to three years you could pull money from the fund, the state fund, to pay for interpreters and then that went away. But um, it was just to basically get you to realize as an organization you needed to build in that line item. But yes, I think there's much more recognition now. But there's still people who fight it. Doctors are notorious. I am sorry to say, the medical profession has really fought it. But some of the hospitals are fantastic. So it's just, and I, and I don't, you know, and I understand. I mean, if, if a doctor or a medical professional is, in fact, you know, a private business owner, everyone's looking at the bottom line. And if that's cutting into, you know, you're, not, you're getting this much from Medicaid, and then you have to pay an interpreter, that can be a challenge. So I totally get that, why there's some resistance. Are there situations where you get clients who weren't 
we try not to have it happen, but yes, um, occasionally it happens, weddings, personal family functions. And I'll tell you, you know, if it's someone I know and they say, can you interpret my wedding? Of course, this is my wedding gift to you. Um, occasionally I get hired as someone I don't know, and then of course I'll charge. But even, or if it's a funeral or something like that, it's like really, it's okay, you know. So it is a small community. It's yes. one language. You tend to know each other. Yes. Is there, is there a conflict? Or I heard that now they actually choose the interpreter they want sometimes. Well, actually, so referral agencies, and this is how we most of us get our work. We're considered to be private contractors. We get most of our work through referral agencies. And it's, I mean, a deaf person always has the right, and, and the hearing consumer too can request. But it's a deaf person who's really going to depend on this interpreter to, um, Again, because the person, because we don't come in with a, you know, a solid A, a solid B, and maybe a C language. I mean, our, we come into American Sign Language coming late. So a deaf person oftentimes is very concerned about, will I understand you, and will you understand me? And in fact, there's going to be a major discussion next week by um, MJ Bienvenu, who is a major interpreter, educator, and, and deaf, um, a deaf person who's also an ASL specialist. And she basically said, you know, are interpreters, sign language interpreters proficient enough? Are we getting what we're getting, you know, are we getting what we're paying for? So, let me say that metaphorically. But um, it is, it's a tight community. We know each other. It can be really a challenge, but I really always believe a deaf person has a right to pick and choose. I, not everyone's going to love me. They're not going to love my style. I don't take it personally. Everyone has a preference. There's some deaf people that we, and also interpreters have, our, we have our hit list, our no-fly list. It's like, no, I want to interpret that person, or no, I'm not going to necessarily interpret with that with my that particular interpret. Most of us we are very collegial, and we interpret with anyone. But it's, there's, it's just, you're right. It's a small community. We have to be very careful. That's why in court we always have to disclose whether or not we know somebody. There was a, a major series of lawsuits. I mean, uh, um, hearings based on a lawsuit, and some of us had been involved in various stages with some of the people who were involved and we had to recuse ourselves because you know we had been part of it to in another stage and so we didn't want to show bias or any perceived bias we knew we could keep it clean but we want to make sure everyone else is insured of that Right. Yes, and I, thank you for that, that notion, and that's that there is a misconception about we only are for the deaf person, and I really drill it into my students. You walk in and you say, hi, my name is Jam. I'm the interpreter for today. I'm the interpreter for this situation. I'm not the interpreter for Sasha, the deaf person, or for or Lucia, for it was the hearing person. It's like I am here for everybody because it's the only reason why I'd be here is that somebody, you know, people in this room are not being able to communicate with each other. So, um, yes, I'm a real bugaboo. That's my my bugaboos. It's we are there for everybody in the room, and so I, that's why I don't like interpreters for the deaf. I'm a sign language English interpreter, and I want both of those languages acknowledged. That's what I do. So and I know that um, at least Queens is changing. We've been doing a lot of training over there, but now if someone says, "Oh, my husband doesn't need an interpreter," I'll interpret for him. Uh, many times the doctor says, "Actually, the interpreter's here for me." Yeah. Right. So I just let her sit in, you know, and if there's a problem. Right. And we have, you know, again, we've got all the confidentiality and <coughs> confidentiality involved when we're talking about medical setting, any setting, actually. So it's not ours to reveal. And that's the one thing. And some interpreters get very, interpreting students get very nervous about strong language, profanity, or some things that they maybe aren't accustomed to discussing or using in their day-to-day -day life. I don't own it. It's not mine. I'm not the initiator. I'm interpreting. <laughs> it's theirs. <laughs> so we always have to we we have to always have to kind of remind the interpreting students that it it is we are there for a reason. We're interpreting the message and making sure how it is given is received. So, and with that, any other questions? If not, thank you so much for the opportunity.